one more time. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we uh, thank you for the great opportunity is now to reflect more deeply on the words you have given us. And we pray, please, by your Holy Spirit, you might cause us to be able to focus, concentrate, understand, get insight, and that most particularly you might cause these words to transform and change us by your Spirit, that we might be more and more the people you call us to be. Help us be discerning today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are some things in life that are scary beautiful. There are some things in life that are scary beautiful. Some things in life that are beautiful, but it's a kind of beauty that's a scary beauty. Do you know what I mean? The Himalayas are like that. I've never been to the Himalayas, but there's a kind of beauty that the Mount Everest, the Himalayas have, a rugged, uh, you know, powerful, great, wonderful, and so on. There's a kind of power that these things have that's also fierce and terrifying. Do you know, there's a sense of it's, it, it being a place that you can enjoy, but you need to take great care. The Southern Ocean is a place like that. You know, the ocean between South Africa, we you get another mention, South Africa and west coast of Australia, that uh, Roaring Forties kind of place, um, it has that kind of rugged uh, beauty about it. One of the things that um, I follow is around the world solo sailing. And at the moment, there's a, a, a race going around the world. They've just entered into the Southern Ocean. They've come down uh, the Atlantic, down into the Southern Ocean. And each of them have been posting, or many of them have been posting photos, footage of the experience of entering that Southern Ocean. And the ones that I've noticed have all talked up how beautiful it is, uh, how extraordinary the... Now, it's just ocean, of course. There's no land. They're in the middle of nowhere. But all of them have noticed the beauty of it, the beauty and the power, the remoteness, the danger... The waves, the extraordinary character of it, they're going through 40 knot winds, 50 knot winds, but there's a beauty to it, a beauty that you take care with. Now this passage that we're looking at this morning has beauty about it. Some of the most wonderful verses you'll find in the Bible that are beautiful, that need to be put on a poster on the wall, uh, this is that chapter that has some of those verses. But they're also the kind of verses that have a scary beauty about them. They're beautiful but they're discriminating in their beauty. They're beautiful, but they're fierce with their beauty. This is not the kittens with balls of wool on the poster. This is the great mountains that are terrifying in their beauty. Now, the passage, it has this beauty. Um, look, chapter 3, verse 1, and let me show you the first uh, wonderful verse that's there, and I, I hope it's one you're familiar with previously. But chapter 3, verse 1, the beauty of the love of God. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. What a beautiful verse. That see what great love the Father has for us, that we should be called the children of God. This is one of the verses that joins a bunch of ideas, three ideas. It's the idea of the great love of God, the great love of God, a love that He has given to us, lavished upon us, that we should be called the children of God. And it's important that those ideas are joined because that you become a child of God is only because of the love of God. You don't become a child of God because you're owed it, because you're worthy of it, because he ought to give it to you. The fact that you can become a child of God is because of the lavish and great love of God. It is his kindness and generosity to have adopted us into his family. Mere creatures and sinful creatures at that. So we have now entered into a relationship with God, the creator, with him as our father and us as members of his family. And the next sentence seems to give a sense of, the, of, of how difficult that, that is to come to terms with. Have a look at the uh, half, halfway through verse 1, and that is what we are. It's almost like the author saying, John saying, um, I know this is mind-blowing, but that's what we are. We are the children of God. Children, John Gospel, there's so much that aligns with John's Gospel and through 1 John, children born not of natural descent or a husband's will, but born of God. It's his choice to give us the right to become his children by the atoning sacrifice of his only son, by the advocate that we have with the Father, by the one who Jesus 
John chapter 4, 1 John 4, who stands in our place and bears the brunt of God's judgment upon our sin, that we who look to him might be forgiven for our sin. It's an astonishing thing that means we are now his children, recipients of God's love. And it changes everything. If you are one this morning who is looking to Christ, not your own merits, looking outside of yourself to be putting your faith in Jesus as your saviour, as the one who has died in your place, as your Lord, if you're looking to him, then it changes everything. You are now children of God. You are loved and you have an identity that is solid, deep and profound, so that in all the ups and downs and grief of life, in all the stresses and strains, as you move through your life and relationships sour, things go wrong, work is stressful, difficult, uh, you find yourself in circumstances of sickness and illness and you're finding things lost, you know, in the midst of all of that, there's a rock upon which you can found your life, which is that you remain a child of God, loved by Him. And he will hold you to the end. He will take you to be with him. Where when he appears, verse 2, what we are has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. One day what you are will emerge to be all that it is in its fullness. Hang on, trust God. I shared a poem at Glynn's funeral this last week and if you were there, wasn't it a sad time full of grief but a great encouragement to consider together the, the gospel again and how our brother Glynn is with the Lord now. I shared a poem uh, from a man called George Herbert who's a dead old guy and you can chase him up. Of course I know you love poetry. Um, chase up uh, his poem. He, he, he casts a conversation between Christian and death Death speaks, Christian speaks. I won't go through it all as I did, but the last little piece of the poem finishes with this, where the Christian says to death, Spare not, do thy worst, I shall one day be better than before. Spare not, bring on your worst, because whatever you do to me, one day I'll be better than I ever was. And that's our brother Glyn. And that is every Christian who is a child of God. One day, verse 2, when Christ appears, we shall be like him. All the old will fall away and what will remain will be glorious, children of God. It's a great and beautiful truth that can sustain you through life, this identity that we have in Christ, that we are his children. But this section that starts uh, with this kind of beautiful presentation of being children of God what starts to emerge, what starts to come to the surface is the fierceness of the beauty of being a child of God. The discriminating character that that creates in a person's life. Because the consequence of knowing this to be true about yourself, the consequence actually of even seeing Christ when he appears, look at verse 2, the consequence, verse 3, is that all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. The consequence of knowing that you're a child of God and that one day you will see him and be like him is that you begin now to purify yourself of sin. What it brings home, what begins to emerge through this chapter is the great concern for a child of God, one who truly is a child of God, to rid themselves of sin. And here you get the fierce beauty of this truth. If you are a child of God, it means you will necessarily act like a member of the family. There's a family likeness that you've now been given. There's a Christ-likeness that you are to embrace. And it will mean you will purify yourself. And so, the words of the author now begin to slide into the particular implications of this beautiful truth for the testing of the genuineness of your Christian profession. It's beautiful what love the Father has for us that we should be called His children. It's a beautiful verse. But he begins now to slide into the discriminating significance of that truth because it now becomes a test for whether you are truly a child of God or not. And here's where it becomes fierce. 
And this is our plan together this morning. What I want to do is show, take you through this test that emerges uh, about whether you are genuine followers of Christ, whether you are genuinely children of Christ. This is um, a children of the Father. This is... Uh, this is deeply concerning, deeply important, it matters. Verse 10, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. How? How can you discern whether someone's a child of the devil or child of God? We're going to go there this morning. Now, in the historical context within which this is written, it was meant to be a great encouragement to the people he wrote to. So 1 John is written to this uh, little community, this little church group in the ancient world, and John writes to them to encourage them that they are children of God. So that's where it starts, that's the context. Uh, and it's, he's doing that because chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 19, there's a group of people that had left this little church. And they'd left this little church claiming that they were the true, genuine Christian. They'd left sort of throwing rocks as they'd left, saying, um, we're the ones who actually have hold of what it is to be truly a follower of Christ, a truly a, 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 um, a child of God. You have lost, you haven't got, you, you aren't as far as we are. You haven't got it all. And so what happens is this little group is very insecure. Now just remember, this is not 21st century Australia. This is first century. So there weren't churches on every street corner. It's not like people were always leaving churches and going to other places like happens in our day and age, so you sort of get used to it and it doesn't distress you much. This is a brand new Christian, this is, the Christian faith has begun. People have left paganism and Judaism to come to this new religion proclaimed by the apostles, proclaimed by John. And John proclaims the Messiah, the Christ, who has come to be a sacrifice of atonement that by his blood shed we can be forgiven and they've left behind everything else to join together in this little community of people. No one else is doing this. It is very isolating. And then a group leave them and as they leave, they create this sense of unease. Have we not got enough? Have we made a mistake? Is John's message that we're believed inadequate? You see the insecurities that have come in. So John writes to them, have a look at chapter 5, this is the key verse actually in the whole letter, John chapter 5, and it's worth underlining because this explains the whole letter to us, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He's writing to this little church and saying, you who do believe in the name of the Son of God, I'm writing to let you know that you are saved. You're the ones who have eternal life, not the group that have left. That's the nature of it. And so when he talks about this kind of test, uh, he's doing it knowing that this little church passes the test and the group who have left fail. So he's doing it to say, no, 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 here's, here's how you can know you truly are saved. Now the problem is today, we're not the church that John wrote to. You mean John wrote to that little church knowing who they were, knowing that they were formed on the basis of his testimony and so he can write to them saying, you know, you are the real deal. But we can't just assume that he's writing to EV Church to say, oh, you're in EV, all's good because EV's awesome. We don't know that. There's churches dotted across the country that are all very different, have different theology, different understandings, different views of things. How do we know whether we're the one? You see, this is the... So for us, it's a different experience as we read this letter. It's the experience of the tests that he uses to discriminate between those who are truly followers of Christ and those who proclaim that they are but are not really children of God. Those tests actually have to become ours. And so we have to consider together with John's writings whether we pass the test. Now, this is a complex thing to do together. Because there's a, there's a couple of potential dangers to this activity. As he goes through this test, it can be unsettling. And you might find yourself wondering. One of the great dangers of going through this is the danger of imagining that he is suggesting that you're saved by what you do. You look with me there at verse 4. Have a quick read. Everyone who sins breaks the law, in fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him, him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or knows him. 
This is how we know, verse 10, whether you are the child of God or the child of the devil. Do you see how this, he's giving a definition of what it looks like to be a child of God. Now, do not fall into the trap of imagining he's saying you were saved by not sinning. He's not saying, whatever he's saying, he's not saying that. He's not saying that you're saved by what you do, by how good you are, how many times you say no to sin. He's not saying that. What he's saying rather is that the consequence of coming to become a child of God by grace, the consequence of being adopted into the family of God by grace alone and not your works or goodness, is that it will so transform and change who you are that there will be necessary evidences that flow. So have a look there at verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. The concept is that when you become a child of God, you're not just legally adopted, you're actually given the Holy Spirit a transforming power of God to remake your character and nature, you're given the seed of God to dwell in you, which means you'll have a new appetite, a new way of looking and thinking. And so you can look at that to see whether you've generally been born again, but you're not born again by that. You're born again by looking to Christ as your atoning sacrifice. So don't misunderstand and imagine he's teaching that we're saved by our turning away from sin. No, 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 no. He's saying that's a way of understanding whether you genuinely have looked to Christ to be saved and put your faith in Him and His merits because that'll bring a consequence of change in your life. I'll come back to this in a moment. Take care that we don't misunderstand He's talking about saved by works. He's not. But the other way this can be misunderstood is to imagine He's teaching sinless perfectionism. Let me explain what I mean. He puts this issue of sin in the ex- most extraordinary, extreme way. And on face value, it's super, super strong. Look at verse 6 again. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Do you continue to sin? Well, no one who lives in him continues to sin. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. How are you feeling? But put it further. Uh, Verse 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who it is who are the children of God. At face value, what he seems to be suggesting is that anyone who claims to be a child of God and yet sins is making a false claim and are not really Christians, not really saved. And in fact, many people have taken it exactly this way and down through the history of the church, there has been this idea of sinless perfectionism that once you become truly a child of God, you'll never sin again. Many have taken this on. In fact, there's been movements that have embraced it. John Wesley uh, tinkered with this kind of idea and the Methodist movement and so on. And we in our own day have got people, uh, I've actually had people leave church, um, talk to me about them leaving church because I admitted that I was a sinner, I, I sinned. And they believed in sinless perfectionism and so uh, left. So it's, it's alive and well today on the basis of these verses. But here's the problem. There are numbers of other of passages in the New Testament that teach that a genuinely born-again follower of Christ will not only at the same time have a new spirit within them who seeks holiness, they'll also continue to have their sinful nature that means... Those two things are in conflict with one another. The book of Galatians talks about this. Uh, Romans chapter 7, uh, we do not do what we want to do and so on. And Romans chapter 8, there's various passages that speak about the expectation of sin in the Christian life. Which then raises for us a question, what is John actually talking about here? 
Because let me put this test to you. Just let, let's just play this out for a second. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. So don't put up your hand, but I'm tempted to, to try and do it, but don't. Which of you, therefore, are Christians? Hands up if you've stopped sinning. Now, I know most of you, and I know none of you have. <laughs> give, me a, give me a couple of hours with you. Just give me morning tea with you, and I'll work it out. So hang on, none of, none of us have stopped sinning, but he says... No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. But if you've stopped sinning, you're a child of God and how blessed to be a child of God. Love, which one of us is a child of God then? Do you see the problem? Well, on face value, it's not encouraging at all. So it does beg this important question, the critical question, what does he mean by to continue to sin? When he says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning, what does he mean? What does he mean when he says, no one who continues to sin has other... What does he mean by continue to sin? Because whatever it is, if you're doing it, it's evidence you're not a child of God. Well, first step to consider... Does he mean sinless perfectionism? Does he mean anyone who continues to ever have a sin in their life? Are there any hints in the letter that he doesn't mean that? That is to say, are there any hints in the letter that when he writes to Christians, he assumes they will sin ongoingly? Can you think of any? Chapters 2, verse 1 and 2. Grab, make sure you've got 1 John open. Have a look at chapters 2, verse 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He assumes, he doesn't want sin, but he assumes they will, and if they do, these people he's writing to, they've got an advocate who can bring um, uh, an appeal to the Father to bring forgiveness and so on. Where else might you go? Yeah, chapter 1, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Notice the language there. It's not, if we claim to have not ever sinned in the past, it's if we claim presently to be without sin. Him, the author, says, I can't claim to be without sin and neither can you, the audience I'm writing to. So whatever he means in chapter 3, he doesn't mean you cease to sin because he assumes that sin will still be part of the Christian's life. Wonderfully, though, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us. That's an ongoing experience. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So he assumes that the people he's writing to will be ongoingly in sin, which therefore begs the question, what's he talking about saying you can't continue to sin? I think the key there is in verse 4. Verse 4 is utterly profound, really very helpful, because it's a definition of sin which transforms the way you think about it. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Everyone who sins breaks the law because sin is lawlessness. What he's doing here is defining sin for us and what he helps us see is that sin is not just breaking a law, though it will do that, but sin is deeper and more profound and important for us to understand. Sin is being lawless. Sin is being outside the law. Sin is being an outlaw. Sin is being outside of God's rule. Out from under his law, do you see? It's being independent of God as your ruler, boss and lord. It's to be lawless, without law. You might make up your own law, but you make up, you make up your own law. And you work out for yourself what will be good and what will be bad and what I'll do and what I won't do. If it happens to agree with God, 
sure, but I don't really care what God says. I'm going to make my choices my way independently free. That is sin. Sin is not just breaking laws, that's the symptom. The disease is lawlessness, rebellion, which will give rise to breaking laws. So sin is breaking laws because at root it's independence from God. It's stepping outside of God, out from under His rule. This is massively important for us to appreciate because there are only two kinds of people on the planet. There are those who live under the rule of God, inside His kingly domain, acknowledging Him as Lord and seeking to live with Him as the ruler. And those who have stepped outside the rule of God who have thrown off his rule and are living lawless, as outlaws, independent from God. They might still be super nice. They might still love their mum. Hitler did. But they might be good to their friends. They might believe love is love. All kinds of things that we might think are lovely. But they're doing it independently from God. What he thinks, what he says, is not their issue or agenda. It's what they want and how they want it. Now, you plug that understanding of sin back into this passage. So, sin is lawlessness, verse 6. No one who lives in him keeps on in lawlessness. No one who continues in lawlessness has either seen him or known him. Do you see how it's shaped? You cannot be a child of God and apathetic to the rule of God. You cannot be in the kingdom of God, saved, and be someone who disregards God's rule, lawless. He's not saying any act of sin proves you're not in the kingdom. He's saying rather, you living as a lawless one, going on in lawlessness shows you've never become a child of God because if you become a child of God by grace, by grace alone, by the merits of Christ and his merits alone, if you become saved then the seed of God is in you, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who is holy is within you, there's a new nature that's born in you who wants now to please your Father and that is such a necessary consequence of having been saved by grace, by the merits of Christ, it's such a necessary consequence that you are born again as a child of God, that if there's no evidence of your now desiring to live under the rule of God, you're not born again, you're not a child of God, you're still lawless. Do you see what he's saying? We are saved by grace, the gift of grace, the granting of forgiveness, not because we're good, but because he's gracious and now that we are born again, adopted, truly born again into the family, we are to have, we will necessarily have a new nature, the Spirit of God. Now this is so important, I want to spend a little bit more time on it and give you an illustration. Now the illustration's gross, okay, um, but it actually suits the, the point I'm making. I'll just give you a trigger warning because I'm just, I just, I've over the years realised not everyone's got the same disposition towards stuff than I do, right? So I remember, do you remember I showed a photo of my operation on my toe where the toe was hanging off? And I thought everyone would find this funny, but people fainted. So anyway, <laughs> anyway so here, here's an illustration, like it, it, it's, it's a sewerage tank. So you can see where we're going already, okay. So imagine the whole town's sewerage supply gets into the, into the treatment plant and there's a massive pond, concrete reservoir, just full of stuff. And you're more vivid, but anyway, there's stuff, right? And you're walking around the edge of the sewerage tank and uh, in some fashion you hold your breath too long and you cause yourself to go unconscious so that you fall into the tank. Yeah. You fall into the tank, unconscious. Now, fortunately, you fall in face up, so you can still breathe and you're, you're lying there in the sewage. Now, someone comes along and, I don't know, injects you with adrenaline or gives you smelling salts. I'm not a medical person, I don't know, but they, they do something and you come back to consciousness. What's the first sign that you're awake? 
What's the first sign? What's the first and necessary, unavoidable sign that you're awake? You want to get out of the tank. You want to get out of the tank. The first essential, not even a choice, it's not like you have to choose to have this thing happen to you, it just happens to you by being brought back to consciousness. Your first sign of being conscious is that you're repulsed by your environment. You're repulsed by the corruption and the stink and the stench and you want out. Do you see? You didn't have to choose it, it's just a natural consequence of being brought to consciousness. Now, do you see how the illustration works? It's a very good illustration, isn't it? <laughs> we have lived in lawlessness and rebellion, sin. It's not just that we've been living breaking laws, we've been living independently of God, disregarding God's rule, thinking I can pick and choose, which we've been living in lawlessness, thinking we were free. And it sounded so nice when we told ourselves that was what we were, we're just being independent, powerful people who were free. But then we were brought to life by God, by His sovereign, gracious gift into our lives. He, he, we are born again by the Spirit, John 3. We are given the right to be children of God by His gracious selection, choice and work. Wow! God brings the message of the gospel to us and awakens us to receive that message. We come to new birth, saved not by our goodness and merit, but saved by His kindness. What is the first sign that you've been brought to life and become a child of God, given a new nature? You're repulsed by lawlessness. You're disgusted by sin. You're horrified at living in independence to God. Sin's not just breaking laws. Sin's rebellious, independence, disregard. And when, when you are brought to life by the Holy Spirit, the first necessary consequence of that is a new attitude towards rebellion against God. And the key point here is that John is not suggesting you will never sin again. Of course, we still toy with sewerage, hard to believe though it is, but we still toy with independence and living life our own way and not wanting to listen to God and wanting to actually do what we think is best. And I know the Bible says, but I, we still toy with that. But to continue in that, to dwell in that, that's what John's talking about. No one born of God dwells in lawlessness, dwells in rebellion to their father, lives in apathy towards the desires of their father. No one born of God lives that life. No one lives with a disposition that rejects the rule of God in their life. And John is putting it as strongly as he can because sin is ugly. He, he, he really does think of it like sewerage. And he, he, he just conceptually, see, he, he says... Um, uh, verse 8, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil. The one who lives in rebellion is of the devil. Because the devil has been rebelling from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work, rebelliousness. No one who is born of God will continue in rebelliousness because God's seed now remains in them. They cannot go on in rebelliousness because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God here and who the children here. Just, just see, here, there, there's, the, there's the teaching of the passage. You with me? Let's now apply it by doing some diagnostic work in your life. And here we need some care. The big question for us this morning is, are you a child of God? Are you one who knows the love of the Father that's been lavished on His children such that you are a child of God, saved by grace alone? Are you that person? Or is it a mere pretense? Now, the problem is in our, in 21st century churches, not just ours, but every church in the country, there'll be people sitting here who aren't truly children of God. 
Now, some of you are here visiting and you're trying to work out all these things, and so I'm not talking to you, but I'm giving you an insight, of course, into what it is to become a child of God. The question for us this morning is, isn't, do you still sin? You do. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We can confess our sins and know that his faith and just and purifies. So it's not, do you sin? Of course you do. You're still carrying around with you your body of flesh the sinful nature it's not that question but the question is this do you dwell in sin do you dwell in sin and it's not do you keep doing that thing habitually that you're struggling with as an addiction that's not the question because some of you are in addictions that are really hard to get out of it's rather have you given in to the addiction are you dwelling in it Have you made peace with it? So you now no longer grieve over it. Are you in that place? That's the question. Every child of God will sin. We have an advocate of the Father, the Jesus Christ, the righteous. Forgiveness and grace to cover all. But no true child will continue in apathy towards sin. There will be a new attitude of heart such that you hate the fact that you are caught in these things and are fighting to get out of them. Your desire ought now to be pleasing Him to want what he wants. Now, do you see how that diagnostic process is much more helpful for us? It's much more true to the passage. Are you thinking about your life? Now, it's still more complex, though. Because the more mature you are as a Christian, the more in touch with the Holy Spirit you are as a Christian, the more every act of sin will feel like a complete failure and certain evidence that you aren't a child of God. You'll be much more sensitised to sin and much more horrified by the fact that you've done it and so much more shattered by it and feeling like, how can I be a Christian? That is the nature of the more mature person and also the nature of the more sensitive conscience. Some of you have got very sensitive consciences. You overthink things and you, you, you see that you've done that and done it again and ask God forgiveness for it again. How can you truly be a Christian? And Satan plays on that. But here's the thing, every true child of God has two emotions happening at one and the same time. Every true child of God has two emotions that are always happening at the same time. Guilt, horror at sin and joy at forgiveness. Every true child of God has those two emotions running along at the same time. Guilt, horror and joy guilt horror at sin i've done it again joy at the astonishing truth that every time we sin he is faithful and just and if we but confess our sins he will forgive us and cleanse and purify us from all sin we have an advocate with the father that if we look to him and not ourselves we are adopted renewed cleansed children of god So is that you? Do you find yourself with those two emotions running along in your life? Well, it's evidence you're a child of God. You see, uh, no, no lawless person is living with grief over their continual failure to please their father. No true, no person who's living in lawlessness, rebelliousness, cares about their sin. Oh, they might care about the condemnation that comes and the possibility of hell, but they don't care that they've failed their father. Whereas if you're a person who's going, oh, I just keep doing it. I'm caught in these addictions and I hate what I'm doing to my God and I I grieve over the lostness of my soul and um, that's evidence you've got the Holy Spirit at work. If alongside that, you also have the beautiful experience of constantly repentance, confession of sin, And coming back to your Father, knowing that He is full of mercy, full of grace. Let me just actually offer a quick word about addictions. Some sin is so deep, it's rewired your brain, so that the battle against some addictions are deeper than just some other sins. That's the case if you grew up with pornography. There'll be a rewiring. That means there's a battle there that'll be a larger battle for you. If you've grown up with alcohol and found yourself binge drinking early on, it'll rewire your brain, you'll find yourself as an alcoholic. These kinds of battles are not to be, do not judge my struggle with addiction as continuing in sin, unless you've made peace with it. 
do not ever make peace with it. Fight and battle by the work of God in your life and the supports that he gives you to continue to find a way through it all. Your desire to be rid of these addictions is the sign of God's work in your life. But let me, let me do two things. If you are sitting here and you sense those two emotions at work, then this is a word of encouragement. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. Go home rejoicing and hating your sin. The two things at once. Praise God, you're a child. He has you. But I do want to offer a warning, a serious warning, because there will be some sitting amongst us who don't care about the will of their father, who don't have a hunger to grow, and you need to be warned. I want to warn you that if you've made peace with your sin and addictions and you find yourself week by week not thinking about the will of your Father and a desire to serve and please Him, you're in a very, very dangerous place. Repent, come back. Fan into flame the work of the Spirit in your life. This is heaven and hell. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 that many will stand before me on the last day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we, didn't we? And He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. You thought you were in, but you never were. Do not let that be true of any of us. Take the warning this morning. If you're growing in apathy, deal with it. Bow your head today and repent and pray that he would flan into flames the work of the Spirit. Let me finish, though, with a deeper thing. The sin we're talking about here is not just breaking rules. It can feel so arbitrary. That's why the illustration of the sin and the sewage is so important. Rebellion, rebellion is, is sin. Sin is lawlessness. It's independence from God. That thing that we as a society think is noble, living our own life our own way, is the sewage. And God is determined to save us from it because it's the work of the devil and it will destroy humanity. Health, beauty, glory and strength is living under the rule of God. And that's only possible because of the work of the Spirit. Let me pray. Father, we, uh, we do pray for a serious work of your Holy Spirit amongst us today, every week. But we would pray, please, that you would move amongst us and stir those who are apathetic to face the seriousness of their circumstances. Please give great encouragement to those who feel those twin emotions of guilt and joy, that you might comfort them and give them great assurance. We pray you do a wonderful work amongst us in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you a true child of God? That is a beautiful and scary passage um, guilt and joy so when I was lost in my rebellion when I turned my heart astray you were the one who came to find me and though my record stood against me though my offence to you so great your loving kindness so much greater and so the joy so I come full of joy and awesome fear yet with confidence draw near to the throne of grace stand and sing these beautiful truths with us as we reflect on that message.
you have kids, please don't forget to go and pick them up. But it's been a really um, encouraging morning this morning, remembering that through Christ we are children of God, um, but the challenge of not being apathetic about that, but allowing Him to transform and shape every aspect of our life. So hopefully we can reflect on that this week, and we'll see you all next week.